and um, on behalf of uh, Shri Ramakrishna Hospital, I welcome all the consultants inside and outside the Ramakrishna Hospital and uh, all the doctors from the city of Coimbatore to this uh, monthly webinar being conducted uh, uh, for the last uh, two and a half years. I really appreciate uh, the response uh, given by you so that uh, uh, it uh, mot motivates us uh, to continue with uh, such webinars uh, uh, so far and uh, in the future also. And uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Sridhar Gobal. He's a consultant uh, hemato-oncologist and uh, stem cell transplant physician who has joined around uh, one and a half uh, years, uh, two years back in uh, Sri Ramakrishna Hospital after uh, getting trained in uh, CMC Velo in uh, stem cell transplant and uh, hemato-oncology. And after joining here, uh, he has started uh, the hemato-oncology unit and uh, he has done a few uh, stem cell transplants also with uh, very good results. And uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Sridhar Gobal and thank him for accepting our invitation to deliver a lecture today. And uh, I think, I hope uh, it will be useful to all the audience, all varieties of audience uh, who have logged uh, on to today's uh, online seminar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sridhar Gobal, and uh, uh, I request you to take over uh, the chair. Good evening, sir. Thanks a lot, sir, for this wonderful invite. And uh, hope I'm audible, sir. Yeah, you're audible. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, yeah. You're audible, and uh, only thing uh, you have to adjust your slides. Yes, sir. Yes. So, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, uh, managing uh, management for uh, RNG's wonderful opportunity. And uh, my slides are visible now, sir. Sir, uh, my, sli my slides are visible now. Invisible. 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 Visible, uh, Is it moving now, sir? Yeah, moving, moving. Okay, fine. So, again, uh, thanks a lot, sir, um, um, for attending such a nice event. Uh, again, the topic for today is a bit interesting, like hidden uh, hematology disorders in clinical practice. And specifically, I um, highlighted hidden because uh, hematology is one such sort of a department where uh, most of the time, most of the symptoms are just non specific. Like uh, the patient will be having some fever, or loss of appetite, loss of weight. And uh, sometimes abdominal pain, you know, dyspnea, and exertion, which is usually contributed to like, like um, to multiple other departments. And when the patient develops some chest pain, the patient goes to cardiology. When the patient develops some um, uh, breathing difficulty, the patient goes to pulmonology. And I'm wondering if such scenario, some patients who are referred here to hematology, if at all because of any drop in hemoglobin or drop in uh, any other uh, significant pathology, and then they will be referred here. So hematology is all about referrals. So uh, definitely, I would like to thank all the referral doctors uh, who are uh, making our department uh, a wonderful thing. And because uh, hematology is nothing clear, yet, we have to go under the carpet to find out what is happening. Because uh, only then we will be able to get a diagnosis. Only then we will be treating accordingly. So uh, our first slide will be like a hematopoiesis, which everyone will be aware of here. So everything comes from stem cell, as we all know. So there will be like a common myelin and common lymphoid uh, progenitor cells. So from which uh, most of the cell lineages or almost all the cell lineages will be coming up. Like uh, the common myelin progenitor is one which gives up to all of most of the blood cells uh, like uh, RBCs, WBCs, and uh, myelocarisate. Among the WBCs, only the lymphoid cells, that is the uh, T cells and the B cells, which will be coming from the lymphoid progenitor. So the spectrum of the problems which we are encountering is like uh, it's like varied spectrum like uh, from uh, not only with the cell images like uh, if it happens to RBC like uh, anemia or polycythemia when the hemoglobin is more than 16.5 when it's a th when the platelet counts are less we call it as thrombocytopenia when the platelet counts are less than one lakh as per the definition is only one lakh but in India again it is still more less at only 70,000 thrombocytosis when the platelet counts are more than uh, 4.5 lakhs leukopenia leuke
even though like we see spectrum of problems uh, in hematology but all these are not clear cut most of them will be multifactorial most of the pay time the, uh, like the, all these things will be hidden under the carpet which, uh, from which we have to dig up and go on so henceforth all these will be case based discussion so that it will be easy for all the clinicians who were uh, here so without making making much time i'll go into cases so i have discussed some almost some uh, some uh, somewhere around eight to nine cases so all these are real cases what we encounter and uh, i will try to say each and every injections what they have given out says have uh, given a trouble in uh, diagnosing and how we have come up with all these such things uh, case number one is a 34 year old gentleman who present with the acute onset breathlessness uh, with the which is exaggerated most on, uh, on exertion, which is there for only 10 days. And there is a significant history of weight loss, somewhere around five to six kgs over one month. Uh, and he had significant loss of appetite. And uh, again, digging up further, he had some uh, history of gum bleeding on and off for the past seven days, but never he had a history of fever or uh, any cough, cold, or any recurrent infections, any, any flu-like symptoms in the past two weeks or before. Uh, nothing was there. Again, uh, he had some occasional black also, which is more in favor of a breeding tendency. So with uh, young age, like uh, acute younger breathlessness, with loss of weight, loss of appetite, and gum bleeding, of course, the first differential from hematology point of view will be to rule out leukemia. Again, for an uh, examination, but, uh, examination uh, he was severely pallor, uh, icterus was there, and there was a bipedal edema. Otherwise, the gum bleeding was there, some mild gum hypertrophy was also there. But there was uh, we were not able to pick up any palpable nodes or hepatosplenomegaly. So again, uh, this is our preliminary investigation, which showed extremely severe anemia, hemoglobin with just 2.9, and the total counts were uh, 920 with the uh, lymphocytosis, almost like 50% uh, of the lymphocytosis. Again, the platelet count were 13,000, the creatinine was normal. So with this picture, again, we were thinking in terms of probably okay, it can be aplastic anemia because there is a gross. Uh, 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 Vastly <clears throat> deranged cell lineages like uh, severe thrombocytopenias in all cell lineages, and there's a lymphocytosis, which is uh, typical of uh, aplastic anemia. So, we were thinking in more in terms of aplastic anemia or acute leukemia. Again, to our surprise, the LFT was uh, uh, like in, uh, deranged with the indirect hyperbilirubinemia, which usually doesn't happen in any such uh, aplastic anemias. Usually, LFTs will be normal. Again, which is more in favor, more towards the indirect. Again, we again uh, there was suspicion regarding hemolysis, which is happening. But uh, the even though there is hemolysis, the other cell lineages why it was decreased. Still, we are not able to uh, discuss upon. So we went with the further investigation where the MC was very high. It was 123, and then differential was again more or less towards the same thing. But there was an extremely high LDH. It was almost touching 3000. Again, uh, which is again towards uh, some B12 deficiency kind of. Uh, so again, we next investigation we did was reticulocyte count. Usually in reticulocyte count, it uh, should be normal or less in case of uh, megaloblastic anemia. But here the reticulocyte was abnormal, it was 4.7. Again, which is not fitting anywhere. Like it is not like a B12 deficiency or it's not like uh, even autoimmune hematic anemia. With, uh, so we are thinking in terms of something like uh, maybe um, uh, dual pathology, uh, where there is a nutritional deficiency along with that autoimmune um, etiology which is hampering which is uh, creating all such issues and uh, subsequently we anyway we did with the tumor lysis marker like calcium uric acid, everything was normal again though the differences which we consider was like acute leukemia uh, like uh, aplastic anemia i said uh, autoimmune hematic anemia again uh, apml because of uh, bleeding with gum hypertrophy and uh, last, last but not least we thought it is a nutrition deficiency even though we thought it less likely because of young age 34 years old the nutrition deficiency is not much common so again we again we went back and uh, we were trying to get some more history because as my professors usually say we are not able to get anything from the constant uh, again go back to the patient get the history so that which will um, give us much more information again uh, when i was uh, keep on asking uh, finally he said yes we received some injection uh, we don't injection what we received but it looked like uh, some nutrition supplement somewhere around a pinkish color uh, kind of which was given as a bottle uh, in uh, infusion so, because he was very tired, this happened almost some two, three days before, before coming uh, here. Again, he was a chronic alcoholic and uh, oh, again, one more thing is the nadi of Kunur. Again, we were thinking more in terms of any sickle or a hemolytic pattern which is happening. Even we are thinking in terms of sickling crisis which can uh, present like this as a aplastic anemia. 
Uh, finally, our peripheral smear almost gave some diagnosis, some clues to diagnose at least. So we had some uh, T under up cells with the hyper sigmoid neutrophils and the macro ovulocytes, which is more in favor of megalovascular picture. But the context, uh, the context again, the B12 came as normal. It was 600. Uh, folate was normal. Ferritin was in almost a high normal kind of. IN was normal. The DCT, direct competence was negative. Uh, the autoimmune workup like ANA, C3, C4, everything was normal. And again, if we were trying to find out if at all anything like uh, we missed in clinical scenario, so we tried to check for the US abdomen, which was again normal. And it was a normal eco texture. Again, uh, we were thinking because he was a chronic alcoholic, we had a suspicion whether it happens like a CLD with the kind of hyperspinism where uh, he can have panchetabinia. Again, the to our, um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> to surprise the liver was also normal. So finally, we were like in a, uh, we were. We don't know what is happening. It's like a dual pathology or like uh, either partial partial deficiency kind of. So again, we went up with bone, bone marrow. The bone marrow again uh, were more in favor of B12 megaloblastic picture, like uh, which where, which showed a hypercellular marrow with increased uh, like uh, erythroblast and megaloblast, and there was also some uh, dysplasias in all cell lineages. So again, this is what I was trying to say. He also had some gum hypertrophy. So again, the bone marrow, as I said, it was a hypercellular marrow with the erythroid hyperplasia with the megaloblastic changes in aspiration. Again, biopsy, it uh, showed a uh, more inferior of B12, but there was some dysposis in all images. So again, uh, we were not convinced with the diagnosis, so we went with uh, a genotyping, like aerotyping, which was normal. And even to rule out the MDS, that is a mild dysplasia, we have done a fish panel, which was also negative. So the, finally, the diagnosis, what we, we got is like a megaloblastic anemia. Again, uh, it was partially corrected because they have given some injection outside. So uh, this explained everything because uh, the heretic response um, could have been there because of the uh, injection. What they give, we think we are thinking more in favor of uh, like any B2 injection which would have been given outside, which would have created a <clears throat> normal B12 with uh, increased heretic response, which usually happens in uh, day three of a starting injection. So again, we. Again, uh, there was a possibility of MDS because the dysposis which was there could also explain MDS. But uh, what we need to understand is uh, in megaloblastic anemia, the dysposis usually happens in case of extremely severe range, like severe, very severe megaloblastic anemia, where uh, because of the ineffective erythropoiesis, sometimes these dysposis can, can also happen. And because of the ineffective erythropoiesis, there is an indirect hyperbilirubinemia with an extremely high LDH. So again, he was started on a B12 deficiency, and again, uh, I, along with uh, folic acid and iron supplements, which everyone is aware of, because B12 cannot clean uh, like uh, um, should not be given alone. It should be always given with the uh, folic acid supplements also. So again, uh, he because of the young gentleman, uh, he we also went ahead uh, and uh, did a pernicious anemia screen, which turned out to be positive. So which explained is uh, despite taking a nutrition supplements or uh, uh, like a dietary supplement from externally. This intrinsic antibody, which was there, could have uh, hampered the absorption, and this resulted in this extremely severe megaloblastic anemia. So again, with, just with the B12 supplements, uh, his uh, count uh, counts everything uh, started to improve. Again, from uh, day six, uh, day fourteen, his counts turned out to be normal. Again, um, he was discharged basically on day six, and subsequently on follow-up, the fatal counts, WBC count, everything came, so seems to be normal. So this was on day 14, again, subsequently the hemoglobin, everything rose up. It went up to almost normal range in a span of two months. So the learning point from here is uh, um, <clears throat> even a single dose of uh, nutrient supplements, either it is B12 in megaloblastic anemia or if it is iron in uh, iron deficiency anemia, is going to change the entire course of the disease and definitely is going to hamper the diagnosis. So what we will usually uh, say is that, like we usually advise is that, we need to get a diagnosis before starting any such uh, uh, treatments from externally, like uh, whether it is B12 or uh, iron, which is extremely common in outside, like to give us a course, a course, a course or a shot of B12 or iron. So this is going to hamper the diagnosis because all the parameters are going to change. All the laboratory parameters are going to change just with single injection. So again, that alone may not be sufficient. So we have to give a course of chemotherapy instead of a single dose. So again, the one most important thing here um, as a learning point is that we have to uh, replace the body stores, which uh, usually happens in severe anemias, 
because just a single uh, because the even if you are not taking uh, b12 today or uh, you are not going, going to get any sort of symptoms tomorrow it's going to be a process like uh, it's uh, like at least it will take at least uh, one year to six one and a half years for the patients to develop the symptoms but once the patient starts developing symptoms everything happens in a span of probably 10 to 15 days so again uh, there are some uh, a number of drugs which can affect in the purine synthesis or the pyrimidine synthesis like uh, what we give when um, uh, dmrds uh, like uh, <coughs> leflunomide or any chemotherapy agents or even some antibiotics like uh, sulfatoxin cimetoprim so these are generally will hamper the um, uh, uh, pyrimidine pur uh, pur uh, synthesis which can result in megaloblastic anemia again there are from few cases where we have picked up uh, some patients with extremely b low b12 deficiency b12 like b12 deficiency can have an extremely higher homocysteine level because everything comes on the same pathway of uh, methyl uh, hydrofolic tetrachloride so because of that given the patient can have extremely high homocysteine levels and they can develop even thrombosis again we have encountered such patients with the thrombosis again young onset thrombosis uh, um, where the, we have found have extremely high homocysteine levels reaching hundreds and uh, subsequently happens with a simple B12 deficiency. So again, the learning point is that we have to give a diagnosis first of all before starting any such corrections and then we have to treat uh, as a complete course rather than giving a single shot. So coming to the uh, case two, it's a 56 year old lady, uh, lady uh, like um, who came with the recurrent, who had some recurrent anemia. Again, there was, uh, she had some occasional palpitation with occasional discharge exertion. That is, she is not like a, a, a symptomatic for anemia per se. So the, all these things happens only on exaggeration, especially like grade one uh, kind of in, uh, NYHA classification. Again, that is, that is no other bleeding manifestation, no any fever, no any infections, no comorbidities, again, no loss of loss of appetite. Apart from mild anemia, which is uh, for a long time, like recurrent anemia, uh, she does not have any complaints per se. Again, so routine investigation, she was found to have hemoglobin 7.8. Again, uh, because of the long-standing anemia, she has received multiple iron supplements for the past seven years, like in the form of oral, parental, everywhere, everything. Again, she denies any history of transmission in the past. Even she had a normal children, a normal labor with the two children. That is uh, no history of transmission even at the, during the pregnancy time. Again, because of that anemia, she also received some erythropoid injection from outside, which was there for uh, past two years. But uh, as per the history, she, her HP never crossed more than 9 gram at all. So again, because of the recurrent anemia, she was referred from, uh, uh, from, referred from a doctor outside. So again, uh, on examination, she had some mild pallor and a mild distress. Otherwise, uh, uh, there was a spleen which is palpable, very small spleen, almost some 3 to 3 centimeters, which was palpable. Again, there was no clear-cut hemolytic phases um, externally, morphologically at least. So again, the investigation-wise, uh, we went ahead here. It is a hemoglobin 8.1 with a low MCV 65, uh, which could be possibilities of, again, iron deficiency is still a possible, which uh, explains uh, what they are given from outside. But again, uh, other cell DNAs like a total count and fatal count was normal, the creatinine was normal. Again, the LFT showed a mild indirect hyperbromia with the bilirubin of 2.7, the indirect of 1.7. Again, um, so the MCV, I said it is 57, uh, which is less. Again, the differential was normal. Again, LDH was slightly on the higher side. The cutoff, we keep it as around uh, either 240, 250. Again, now it's around 348. Again, here also the retic was on the higher side, which is 3.7. Uh, calcium, uric acid, everything was normal. Again, so which is more in favor of some uh, mild hemorrhage which is happening, which are uh, uh, the retic response is there, and the LDH also is high, and even the bilirubin is also on the higher side. So again, the peripheral smear, to our surprise, had shown some, uh, what I am marked here is the NRBC, which is called as a nucleated RBCs, which usually happens in... Uh, any hemolytic anemia, especially non-immune hemolytic anemia like thalassemia. Again, uh, there was there is microcytosis, uh, uh, hyperchromia, like basophilic sickling and uh, polychromatophils, and there are some few target cells, and uh, which you can see in these uh, slides. Again, uh, this uh, is nothing but a nucleated RBCs, which usually happens in severe stress, kind of, or some sometimes in most common in uh, any hemolytic disorders. Again, to our surprise, the iron it was not iron deficiency. The ferritin was even on the higher range, it was 1,630. Uh, the normal range of ferritin is somewhere around 350, like 15 to 300, what we usually generally take it as uh, into account. Now the ferritin is extremely higher, it is 1,630. 
and then iron was also very high again uh, the for uh, to rule out the uh, immune hemolysis we have done a dct which was negative again we went ahead uh, and digging up the history and then it uh, he, she said that uh, there is also anemia in her uh, sister and she uh, sister was transfused in, in the past during her pregnancy name again this uh, again uh, we started thinking in terms of more of a uh, hemolytic anemia like uh, like uh, i said uh, thalassemia non human hemolytic anemia again we have done uh, hemoglobin forces which uh, clinch the diagnosis now uh, here if you see that uh, hba2 is almost 4.6 percent uh, the normal is somewhere around 3 so finally it hap she happens to be thalassemia trait so which she was been treated for iron deficiency for years together without do, without uh, even knowing having any diagnosis so this happens to be a simple thalassemia trait uh, so where she does not require transfusion even does not require any iron supplements on the other way around because of very rich iron like uh, very high iron like almost ferritin of six, sitting at 2600 she was started on iron chelating agents like just uh, uh, <clears throat> we are started on deferoserox so um, uh, coming to the disease uh, like the hemoglobin is one test which we can easily pick up any sort of inherited uh, hemoglobin pathways like thalassemia sickle cell hemoglobin e hemoglobin d hemoglobin c and all again for confirmatory purpose we go into molecular testing in the form of uh, reverse dot product assay or uh, any multiplex pcr so um, this will be especially helpful to confirm a diagnosis and uh, in second scenario will be if the patient happens to be transfused recently again uh, all these transfused rbc will also be coming into picture for hemoglobin electrolysis so in that scenario we have to go ahead with um, geno uh, molecular testing to confirm the diagnosis again this is a general like simple workup for thalassemia uh, for the pgs who are um, hearing this so any patient with anemia we should always first and foremost is to check for the mcv So normal MCV range is between 80 to 100. Any patient like any anemia with the MCV is less than 80, we have to think in terms of only two things. It can be like either iron deficiency or or any uh, a thalassemia like uh, hemolytic anemia. So again, the peripheral smear uh, will give the give us some sort of clue with inclusion bodies or uh, necessary NRBC, some target cells. And then again, we have to check for the ferritin level. If the ferritin is less than 12, which is more in favor of iron deficiency, we have to give some iron corrections, and then we have to wait and watch. Sometimes, most of the time, almost 90 percent so that will be improvement. Some patients, some set of patients who may not be improving with uh, just uh, oral supplements or a nutri parental supplements of iron, then there are such patients called as iron resistant iron deficiency anemia, which is like uh, beyond the scope. And then um, of the discussion today. again then uh, next thing we have to go up with the ultra forces because of the ferritin is less then which will uh, pick up the diagnosis almost uh, 95% of the times in case of uh, microcytic hypoglycemic anemia so again the thalassemia again it's a spectrum of disorder the thalassemia clinically it can be classified as three like uh, thalassemia major which requires consistent trans like uh, continuous transfusion the patient uh, may not survive without transfusion usually the transition starts at 6 months of age whereas the thalassemia minor on the other way it's like this and that spectrum where the patient does not require any transfusion seldom require um on the other way like the patient will have extremely high loads of iron the reason being the because of that um, even though they are iron um, they are not iron deficiency because the cells will try to produce so there will be increase in iron absorption from gut and everywhere so this results in uh, increased iron like especially ferritin will be very high and most of these patients will recover iron chelation rather than iron supplements again the third set of group is a thalassemia intermedia where the patient will be intermediate uh, like between these both like most of the time the patient may not recover transfusion and they will recover transfusion only at some scenarios like pregnancy or infection in such cases we will have to transfuse again the clinical presentation of thalassemia which almost everyone is aware like a failure to thrive in uh, pediatric age group like especially uh, irritability pallor and uh, sometimes uh, enlarged abdomen and uh, the patient will have hepatosplenomegaly and cardiac failure go through duration everything and uh, almost uh, everyone is aware of this thalassemia like hemorrhagic phases where they have frontal bossing uh, <coughs> malar prominence and huge hepatosplenomegaly and crook cut appearance in uh, a skull so again uh, one easy thing which can uh, which will be able to distinguish uh, iron deficiency and beta thalassemia is menstrual
anemia or not iron deficiency anemia most almost uh, i would say that as an hematologist all anemia irrespective of whatever hemoglobin it is if it is less than even with less than 11 please go ahead with the basic evaluation because many a times we have picked up cases with myeloma and everything just with the hemoglobin of the 10 again all thalassemia will not require transfusion almost a huge setup operation like thalassemia trait and intermedia does not require transfusion at all over the period of uh, over the lifetime again the requirement of transfusion if at all happens to be thalassemia is based on the clinical needs and uh, rather than based on the hemoglobin levels and then uh, some patients who uh, even uh, many times we get a call from uh, like some patients will require a splenectomy or not if the patient is recurrently tra uh, transfusion dependent then they may require it. again it's not indicated for all again uh, case number 3 is uh, like a 71 year old gentleman who presented with uh, bleeding pr like uh, again this bleeding was almost there for 2 years and again uh, every time there happens to be some bleeding his uh, hemoglobin will drop again uh, he used to get transfused uh, almost there, there was a total units of transfusion which was done for this bleeding pr again he also had some history of loss of weight and appetite uh, and uh, apart from that there was no other bleeding manifestations for apt and at 25 35 for apt the hemoglobin is very less it's only 6.2 again uh, basically he was referred for laparotomy and proceed and because of this high uh, d range high d range pt apt and uh, uh, hemoglobin like uh, anemia so uh, he was basically sought for clearance again i went in uh, touch with the uh, gastroenterologist here and uh, and uh, he said that because this much uh, small diverticulosis did not explain this much uh, recurrent bleeding and uh, recurrent transfusions So again, on examination, he was thin built, uh, emaciated, and uh, it was severe pallor. Uh, there was otherwise, uh, he was also had some mastitis. Otherwise, no palpable nodes was there. Again, this was our CBC picture, like uh, hemoglobin six point two. Uh, again, I mentioned, forgot to mention the MC. It was normal. Uh, total count is normal. The platelet count was less. It was eighty thousand. Again, the peripheral smear is almost more or less normal. But again, uh, the PT ability is significantly high, even uh, despite repeating. so this again uh, uh, was like a bit of uh, worrisome for us because the uh, high uh, high d range repeat apt so we were thinking to have some breed that this is and uh, like uh, hemophilia uh, uh, kind of again um, so again we went at with the further testing like stool hackel blood was positive which is said that the patient is uh, losing blood from uh, like uh, recurrently and the creatinine was uh, in the higher side 1.2 the calcium was also on the higher side was 10.5 um again the bleeding was normal again for our surprise the total protein was less high it is high normally up to 6 68 now it is 8.5 there is a there is a age reversal the almost only 2.7 again the corrected calcium is going to be somewhere high somewhere around 11 to 11.5 so this had a bit of a worrisom because uh, hypercalcemia with the age reversal again there was uh, anemia and uh, it was and the creatinine was 1.2 so this again uh, was more in favor of some hematolog hematological problem which is going on so again we went ahead with the uh, urine uh, benstone protein because we had a myeloma in the back of our mind but again uh, urine uh, benstone protein was negative even we went ahead with uh, and uh, did a serum electrolytes which was negative like uh, there was we could not find out any m band here so anyway because of this uh, some uh, uh, diagnostic difficulty we went ahead with the, uh, and go for um, bone marrow to a surprise the bone marrow turned out to be uh plasma cell neoplasm with the plasma cells of almost 30 percentage so again so again we went up with the complete serum free right chain assay which uh, was accepting that they had some myeloma or some bone like the uh, neoplasm inside so it took lots of time for us to convince uh, that so and so uh, cancer was there inside and uh, we went ahead and started with the bortezomib based regimen again before that we had taken some um, imaging which showed see a clear cut uh, lytications in the skull femur and almost almost everywhere 
so this explained the almost all the pathologies like the severe anemia um, and hypercalcemia and uh, ag reversal so again uh, there are only few because um, because of this we there we went in like a, a almost search for literature and there are some fake case reports where uh, the bleeding manifestation in myeloma was reported again this could be of plenty of reasons like uh, because of uh, dysfibronogenemia like uh, paraplatin induced the platelet dysfunction short term platelet survival and uh, damage to vascular endothelium which uh, which could be a reason for any of this again we were trying to do a biopsy but because of financial constraints we could not be able to get the biopsy of the uh, diverticular uh, lesion which was there so again uh, i said uh, one more there are few plenty of case reports regarding that the ga bleeding in uh, myeloma so it finally it happens to be a myeloma which presented as a bleeding manifestation especially in the form of pr the patient received complete chemotherapy of uh, six cycles and subsequently he is a regular follow up till now without much of a bleeding and hemoglobin is holding at almost 12 to 13 so um, what uh, we are trying to say is that uh, from that from that case the learning point is like uh, all such bleeding manifestation need not be bleeding that is like uh, any platelet dysfunction function disorders or any clotting disorders like hemophilia so some hematological problems can like malignancies like myeloma can also present like in the form of bleeding diagnosis. So coming to the case number four is uh, like a two year or three months old girl like uh, who was presented to a pediatrician here with a fever uh, in sorry pediatrician local hospital with fever for three years and severe joint pain and she also had uh, the baby also had some multiple joint pain with the difficulty in walking and playing again um, there is history of loss of weight and appetite and uh, she was diagnosed as a probable JRA outside, like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis outside. And uh, she was started on uh, diflazogat. Uh, we could not be able to find any such, any other evidence for uh, JRA. Anyway, the patient was started on steroids. Uh, the child was uh, clinically better. Uh, the child started to move, walk around, and play playful, and everything improved all of a sudden with steroids. Again, uh, because of juvenile rheumatoid uh, arthritis. And a uh, baby was referred to a rheumatologist here, and he noticed to have some lymphocytes, almost 80 percentage in the outside reports. And because of the lymphocytes, he was referred to me. Again, um, uh, as I said, the lymphocytes were almost 80 percentage. Again, we uh, again we had some histories. There was not much of a uh, fever, cough, cold, uh, uh, apart from loss of it, loss of a bit, which she had earlier. Now, with steroids, everything improved. Again, but uh, on examination, she used, she had some multiple small cervical, axillary, inguinal, everywhere the nodes were there. So again, uh, I went. She convinced the parents and stopped the steroids. Again. Uh, <clears throat> They were very much apprehensive why we are stopping steroids. Again, because we are not able to get the exact diagnosis, we stopped steroids for a while. Again, um, so after a span of almost uh, um, two weeks' time, again, uh, we repeated the counts. This time, the lymphocyte has gone up further and it went up to 91.8 percentage. So again, uh, again, the peripheral smear did not reveal any abnormal cells, but uh, on the contrary, um, she started the node size increased and she started developing fevers uh, again joint pain difficulty in walking fever everything she started to develop once we stopped steroids again now uh, the peripheral smear showed a, a few atypical cells uh, for the span of two weeks again uh, these atypical cells are not clear cut we cannot we cannot say it as uh, any hematological or any blast kind of so again after a lot of discussion with the parents we went ahead with the uh, biopsy of uh, node biopsy and also bone marrow biopsy and uh, finally, it, uh, the, this case turned out to be a ALL, it's acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it's a, like, uh, ex, uh, like blood cancer which was missed all these previous settings. So uh, she was started on chemotherapy as per the standard protocol, what we follow is the BFM protocol. And currently, uh, she is on maintenance and a regular follow-up, she is extremely good now, like she is on regular maintenance and probably she will accompany chemotherapy in a span of uh, probably three months. So why we are saying here is the steroids are like are the double edged sword. So the steroids will mask most of the underlying hematolymphoid malignancy because either it is leukemia or lymphoma, especially like ALL or any lymphomas, most of them the steroids will be given as a treatment regimen, will be a part of the regimen, but it is not the only part of treatment. So these steroids definitely is going to mask the underlying hematolymphoid malignancy. 
and uh, it's uh, like it, it will uh, it will hamper the diagnosis it will uh, delay the diagnosis for a span of 2 to 3 weeks uh. the fortunate thing is that the patient has not worsened further and she patient uh, has not went into any sort of cytopenias and uh, landed up in bleeding so here uh, because of stopping steroids we were able to get the diagnosis and then um, uh, almost it took uh, almost one month to diagnosis for this uh, ALL and finally uh, we were able to get uh, in touch with the um, patient and then we were able to went ahead. So the steroids should be used in care in any sort of uh, uh, hematolo hematological settings. Again, why I'm stressing here is that it's general consensus like uh, most of the time in, uh, in uh, uh, general uh, settings, the steroids will be given as a shot to for all the patients developing fever, yes, like for three to four days, give a shot of steroids, which is going to uh, improve the uh, symptomatically. But the underlying diagnosis may be masked and it will uh, remain under the cover, we cannot be diagnosed at all. Again, case number five is uh, basically again a very interesting case here. Okay, this patient is uh, a seven-year-old boy, young boy who presented uh, to from uh, uh, <clears throat> Dharmaburi. This patient uh, presented with the low back pain, with the difficulty in walking, and that he had a difficulty in passing urine, and uh, sometimes dribbling of urine was there. And um, he also had some urinary incontinence. Uh, he had a history of fever for the past five days. Again, loss of weight, loss of weight, which was evaluated in the local hospital. And then, uh, because of that, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> they had done a MRI outside, which is uh, showed some uh, lesion in the spine, for which he was referred to a neurosurgeon here. Again, uh, we have repeated a MRI here, which he showed some. Uh, um, actually, sorry for that. I don't have the MRI image here, uh, which showed a diffuse marrow signal alteration in the calvarium and the vertebra, which is uh, more in favor of uh, some hematolymphoma malignancy, probably leukemia or lymphoma. And otherwise, uh, because of the suspicion, and uh, again, uh, there was a drop in fatal count, the uh, opinion was sought for hematology. Again, um, on exa like examination, the child was otherwise normal, a mild hepatitis was there, a mild gamma hepatrophy was there, otherwise no hepatosplenomegaly or no nodes. And uh, the thing is that the fatal count was only 35,000, and the total count was almost 35,500. And because of uh, bicep opinion with the leukocytosis, uh, with, uh, with the MRI suggestion of some probability of leukemia or lymphoma or some, uh, some <coughs> malignancy for which the opinion was sought. Again, um, the peripheral smear to our surprise showed the, all these uh, atypical cells, which is not uh, like which is uh, more in favor of a blastoid morphology. So again, uh, convincing a lot, we went in with the bone marrow. This bone marrow was uh, this showed the picture of acute myeloid leukemia with a blast of more than almost some 40, 50 percent, which was occupying the entire marrow, which resulted in a severe cytopenia and leukocytosis. So he happened to be acute myeloid leukemia. Basically, he was referred for a back pain. Again, the back pain in my AML is not very common. Uh, sometimes it happens in case of myeloid sarcoma. In general, AML present with uh, fever and loss of weight, loss of weight, and usually sometimes with the gum bleeding or any bleeding transition. So again, we went with again molecular workup of uh, genotyping, which showed uh, karyotyping was uh, 821 translocation, which is considered good risk in AML. Again, he was started on uh, standard chemotherapy with uh, induction followed by HIDAC. And uh, <clears throat> the chemotherapy went on well. The patient uh, went in remission. Even uh, minimal result was negative. And he's on regular follow-up. Again, um, the learning point from here is, again, all such, as I said, uh, all such bicytopenias or leukocytosis, if it all happens to be there, it definitely needs to be evaluated further for any sort of hematolytic malignancy. So most of them, as I said, even this, uh, the many patients may not present, uh, present to us with back pain, especially if it happens to be like any other department. If it all happens to be any uh, deranged uh, counts, then it is always advised to get a hematology follow-up so that we will be able to get up what is happening. So again, there are some, uh, the, the, um, this patient also sustained multiple infections, fungal pneumonia, everything during the course of chemotherapy. And even he was uh, planned for transplant uh, over a period of time, but fortunately everything was good for him. And this, uh, this patient um, so far doing well with uh, <coughs> the, all the treatment which is going on. So again, uh, this is just a simple approach for AML. AML as such is a very bad disease. Uh, is, I, I will say it is one of the very most difficult disease to treat because it is a, the, because of the risk of infections, I will say, because the patients can catch up the, any sort of infection from uh, which changes from bacterial to fungal, which is extremely common in AML. 
and even this last question after discussed uh, went on with uh, like he caught up a fungal pneumonia where we need to give oriconsul for almost um, uh, six weeks duration and subsequently the patient uh, like uh, <coughs> came up well so um, any patients who is young and fit will go for chemotherapy in AML. Any patient uh, more than 60 years generally may not be fit for any injection chemotherapy and they, we will be giving a, a lesser chemotherapy in the form of uh, azacitinine or hypermethylating agent, which is usually considered standard of approach in any AML. So again, uh, case number six is uh, a 21 year old boy with uh, <coughs> abdominal distension. Uh, with abdominal discomfort this patient again basically was referred to us for uh, anemia like uh, for uh, basically for clearance for surgery he happens to have abdominal distension abdominal discomfort past two years and um, otherwise he also had some mild uh, tiredness and uh, the yellow discussion of urine with fever again uh, past history also he had some history of anemia in the past this is there for almost 10 years so from he was diagnosed anemia at the age of 11 and from that time he is uh, on taking some supplements and uh, uh, and supplements and everything. At one time, we had a uh, admitted with fever in the local hospital where they were transferred to one unit of Paxil. Again, a further history the family history, his brother, younger brother, was uh, uh, had some history of surgery. Again, he happens to have a spinectomy in the family. So, again, outside hemoglobin, outside USD, I was showed a massive spinectomy. And uh, he was found to have severe anemia with hemoglobin 7.4, for which uh, um, he was separated for clearance. Again, um, so, on examination, he had some massive spinomegaly. Apart from that, everything else was more or less normal, apart from mild pale and mild ectus. Uh, hemoglobin was around 8.3 with uh, normal MCV. But here, the one thing is the MCHC was higher. It was uh, almost 37, um, which is, gave us a clue up front. But anyway, we went ahead with the other investigations in the form of peripheral smear, which showed some marked spherocytosis with uh, a low normal platelet count of 1,17,000. Again, as I said, this was a marker spirocyte which was there in almost every field. We were able to get up, uh, get a good number of spirocytes everywhere. Again, uh, because of that uh, spirocyte disease, which is also common in any autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we went ahead with uh, DCT, which was negative. The retic was higher. The autoimmune markers like ANA, viral markers, everything was negative. Again, the differential what we consider was any non-immune hemolytic anemia or, uh, and a D or sometimes even a DCT negative AHA. So again, uh, the hemoglobin ultra was, non was normal. But uh, because of the high MCHC and the humidity picture and the normal HPLC, we went ahead with the uh, osmotic fragility test, and uh, which showed uh, increased osmotic fragility. Again, uh, the test cells had um, uh, compared to control showed increased lysis on <clears throat> in the hypertonic saline. So, which favored the diagnosis of uh, uh, health spirocytosis. Again, we also did a marrow just to confirm nothing else is there on the marrow, which showed a hypercellular marrow with a normal florid hyperethron hyperplasia, which shows the marrow responding to the amount of anemia. So, diagnosis happens to be here to the spirocytic disease, and basically the spinotomy was deferred here. We have I have called back the surgeon and said that this patient is the HS and he need not request spinotomy because he is not recurrently requiring any transition. So the indication for spinotomy in HS or in sort of, this is the guidelines which shows uh, the spinotomy recommendation in any such uh, inherited hemoglobinopathies or any enzyme deficiencies. So in HS, it's like uh, any patients only if they are recurrently transmission or transmission dependent or suffer some severe anemia, then there's an indication to do spinotomy here. Despite having huge spleen, the, the patient is asymptomatic for us, uh, either um, abdominal distension or abdominal pain or if the patient is happens to have any um, recurrent transfusion then uh, there is a need to indication to treat um, here so this patient was deferred for uh, spleen uh, spinotomy sorry again the case number seven is uh, basically a 64 year old gentleman uh, who uh, happens to be like uh, having a weakness of right upper limb and lower limb and uh, he also had history of uh, loss of weight uh, almost three kg which is not that kind of significant for his age again um, he also had some history of transmissions in the past uh, in uh, this patient is from Tirupur so basically uh, outside investigation uh, the MRI was in it showed ischemic stroke with a hemoglobin of 6.7 and uh, because of that uh, ischemic stroke they went ahead and uh, thrombolized with streptokinase Again, because of the low hemoglobin, he was transferred to unit Paxil. That was the discussion outside. And subsequently, the next day after giving uh, septic he started to have a uh, discoloration of the chest wall everywhere. 
and subsequently the hemoglobin desperate transfusion of two pack cell it dropped to 5.4 for which he was referred here again uh, he was admitted in the neural neurology department and then subsequently uh, the opinion was sought because of anemia the bleeding and thrombosis like it's there almost uh, it's involving the entire spectrum so otherwise on history wise he did not had any other excess bleeding uh, with uh, even following minor trauma in the past okay there is no history of any bleeding tendency in the past so again the basic investigation revealed uh, apart from uh, low hemoglobin like uh, severe anemia 4.3 it was uh, more or less normal mc was normal um, again, which show which is more in favor of uh, <clears throat> any blood loss anemia. So we went ahead with the look for any bleeding diagnosis. Here the PT was extremely high, it is 87.1 seconds. Again, the APTT was uh, 68, despite repeating twice. So again, uh, because of this extremely abnormal deranged PT APTT, both the anti and anti was stopped. And then uh, because of this uh, deranged uh, APTT, we have done a mixing study that is what we call it as off question of control, which was normal. So that means that uh, it could be a congenital uh, coagulopathy, uh, coagulation disorder, like uh, any example like hemophilia or uh, factor 10 or factor 5 deficiency. So such patients can have a, mm, uh, can, can get a normal PT after doing a mixing study. So again, uh, some uh, common factor pathway like uh, 510, apart from that, like uh, 5000 was also done. The 5000 level was tended to be low, it is 83. Normal range is 150 to uh, 400, uh, 350 or 300. So again, the fibrinogen is uh, very low, it is 83. So if at all the patient happens to be fibrinogen, we will be thinking in terms of more in DIC like picture where the uh, fibrin can be extremely low and the patient can have like, all this B malnutrition. But uh, clinically, he is not in active DIC and uh, the patient is clinically stable. And again, uh, he was transferred with the uh, Paxil here to stabilize the patient. Again, he was closely monitored for bleeding. He had not developed any sort of bleeding or thrombotic episodes. Again, USD was done, which showed normal liver echoes, and uh, which uh, <coughs> almost uh, so the risk versus the benefit of thrombosis was the bleeding was explained in detail. And finally, he went up for the coagulation workup, and he happens to be uh, acquired dysfibrinogenemia. It was diagnosed uh, as acquired dysfibrinogenemia because this was not a congenital fibrinogen disorder. It happens to be acquired because all these years there was no such bleeding menstruation in the past. Despite uh, some, uh, even after doing any, he yeah, haven't had any surgeries in the past, but uh, despite that, there was not much of a bleeding menstruation. So it happens to be uh, acquired dysphagnogenemia, again, uh, for which he was waited. Again, after two weeks uh, of starting, um, we slowly started up an antiplatelet, and subsequently, he did not develop any such bleedings, and he is on regular follow up again. So again, uh, one such uh, thing what we do is, uh, especially if it happens to be a deranged PT ability, we tend to do a mixing study here which gives a clue most of the range. If at all the patient happens to be correcting with a mixing disorder, like mixing study, like uh, this happens usually in any sort of congenital uh, coagulopathy, uh, like congenital, uh, <coughs> like uh, factor disorders, uh, where the even if it's the grossly deranged PT, APT, usually tends to correct by doing a mixing study. But if at all that is not getting corrected, that means he is, uh, which is, mo this is more in favor of a lupus-like anticoagulant or a lupus, which usually don't correct in do by doing mixing study. This would be a sing, simple test which we can able to find out. Because the patient had a both grossly deranged PT and APTT, we were thinking in more in terms of a common pathway disorders like factor 10, 5, and fibrinogen. And um, here he happens to have a low fibrinogen, hence uh, this fibrinogenemia was uh, considered for this patient. Again, um, uh, case number eight is a young boy of 13 years who was referred to us by uh, our surgeon uh, for abdominal distension. He had a gross abdominal distension. Like, uh, because, but he did not have any pain or any such, uh, any uh, problematic, basically, for abdominal distension. He just had abdominal distension. Basically, he went to gym, uh, this 13 year old went to gym, and he thought that he developed some six packs, kind of, and uh, he was uh, and going on uh, peacefully without any problems. And he had some mild tiredness and uh, abdominal distension for about two, two months, for which he has taken some over the counter medications. And uh, he did not have any fever or any loss of weight, lots of weight, and bleeding emulsions. Again, as I said, he was absolutely normal. Uh, there was no pallor or no abdominal lymph nodes, but he had a massive spleen almost touching, uh, almost reaching the lower end of the iliac fossa, even touching the iliac crest. So, again, uh, vitals was normal. Again, uh, the basic parameters were, was uh, same. <coughs> the test was sent. To our surprise, they called me from lab saying that uh, the total count was almost 4,11,000. Uh, 
so again i call them like uh, it is a fatal count or wbc again they said no sir it is only uh, wbc which showed almost 4 lakh 11 thousand and the hemoglobin was only 7.8 again the differential was sorted it uh, showed almost the shift to left with the uh, increase in myelocyte and metamyelocyte for blast of 2 percentage uh, which is more in favor of any uh, most likely any myeloperfusion neoplasm probably cml was our uh, differential which was cml is a chronic myeloid leukemia but the thing only thing which is against is this young age usually 13 years old cml is less common usually the literature says only less than 1% less than 2% will be uh, the patient with the uh, age of less than 10 or less than 13 again other parameters of uh, tumor analysis everything was negative and uh, this was the peripheral smear you can see almost uh, jam packed results like almost fully bluish in color which showed lots of left side left shift into the uh, peripheral smear uh, like into the blood picture again uh, the differential what we consider again is acute leukemia which is much more common in the seed again followed by mild neoplasm again we went ahead with the uh, bone marrow aspiration uh, to be true the bone marrow aspiration was very tough because uh, the patient because it's a jam packed marrow we were getting only dry tap we could not able to any uh, get any particles but whatever particles and imprint smears we have we had diagnosed as uh, mild neoplasm neoplasm as a possibility uh, again, the trifin, which is uh, more in favor of uh, myeloplasm neoplasm, uh, which is the picture of uh, bone marrow here. You can see almost all the metas, uh, myelocyte, myelocyte, which is uh, almost on the, it's almost completely uh, <coughs> like fulfilling marrows. So again, uh, the questions what we have in our mind is uh, whether uh, uh, CML can happen in this very young age, or it could still be a possibility of juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia, which is very common in this age, or any CMML. Again, CMML is usually in the elderly age group. It's not in the periodic age group. So we went ahead uh, should, uh, with uh, garotyping, BCL, and a complete EMPN panel. Again, uh, what uh, we had uh, to our uh, surprise, uh, it was uh, garotyping was clear cut. If you look at chromosome positive and standard location 922, and he happens to have a diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia. So as I said, uh, juvenile uh, like uh, juvenile CML is uh, again very few case reports are there for juvenile CML. Even there is no diagnostic criteria for juvenile CML in WHO. So he was suffered an imatinib 400 with which uh, his counts shattered like anything. And uh, uh, this happens just one month before. And the current the counts for him is somewhere around one lakh. And uh, and hopefully uh, in a span of two weeks is going to be normal again. But the spleen is almost more than 50 percent down now. So as I said, uh, mostly in a two weeks time, everything goes to be go is going to be normal. So again, the B cell label which we sent, it turned out to be positive for major transcript, and uh, <coughs> he happens to be CML. So the last case, uh, so it's uh, just happened yesterday. So basically, it's a 13 year old girl who was uh, so almost like 5:30, 6 o'clock. They called from uh, uh, gynecology board saying that the patient is uh, urgently um, needs his opinion, sir. This patient is having a total of 30,000. And uh, basically, the patient, uh, it's an elder, uh, like, um, sorry, <coughs> younger kid, uh, like, uh, he is, uh, she is actually, like, suspected vaginal fusion for the surgery is being planned. So, because of the pedal count of 30,000, uh, they call it uh, an urgent. And on exam, like, uh, history wise, uh, the child used to have a recurrent UTI. Even now, the patient is having some uh, fever and flu symptoms. Otherwise, you know, if any uh, URI, um, like, uh, mild URI was there, no bleeding or melina, headache or vomiting. Otherwise, no issue between bleeding in the past or any bleeding in the family, and no uh, bleeding after my minimal trauma. And uh, as I said, uh, clinically, the patient was, uh, the child was extremely stable, apart from that uh, vaginal, uh, like uh, vaginal fusion, uh, which she had. So again, uh, the investigation, prior investigation showed a hemoglobin from 12.3 and the petal of 30,000. Again, the differential, what we consider as uh, could be uh, probable because the patient is having fever, it could be viral news from a cytopenia or uh, any patient in sepsis, but the clinically the patient is not in sepsis and ITP is a possibility because ITP is just a diagnosis of extrusion or a simple pseudothrombocytopenia. Again, uh, again, I asked the staff how they have calculated sample, when they have calculated sample, how they have transferred everything, we usually generally tends to ask. And the staff said that there was a difficulty in collecting sample because the child was not cooperating. And we were able to get only very minimal sample, uh, only 0.5 ml was given in EDTA. Then almost we got a diagnosis here. It, uh, so we, I asked for a repeat uh, uh, sampling. Again, here the parietal count is almost 2.2 lakh, which is almost no, which is all normal. So all the parameters which were sent was normal. So it happened to be a simple pseudothrombocytopenia, which is EDTA induced because of uh, um, very minimal, because of sampling error or a very minimal sample of only 0.5 ml. 
this is the one which usually get mixed up uh, mixed up most of the times and, uh, and uh, as you said uh, as you say like as you see all this uh, in EDTA induced pseudocompass lipidemia, all these platelets used to get uh, clumped against the uh, WBC cells and uh, which will have tend to have a very low platelet count. So that's why when you are picking up a pulter, it may not be uh, yielding exact norm, exactly normal platelet count. So um, again, uh, the simple thrombocytopenia approach, like uh, before going to the workup for thrombocytopenia proper, we have to rule out the artificial uh, platelet count uh, with pseudothrombocytopenia. But then we have to go further. Again, the learning points here is um, uh, in this is my last slide. The learning point here is any sort of hematology problems. We have to get the complete history. Again, we need to go to and fro for just for history, and then before going to any sort of diagnosis, the complete examination is mandatory. And uh, if it happens to be a platelet disorder, like any thrombocytopenia, always wrote a solo thrombocytopenia. And uh, any the uh, deficiency in cell line. Please check for the other cell lines. Like if the patient happens to be anemic, we have to check for other cell lines like WBC and Pretel, check for the morphology and everything. And uh, please don't treat values. We have to treat patients because many times I said the patient can have a falsely low values because of sampling errors. Because hematology is uh, we largely depend on the laboratory parameters because if at all there happens to be a sampling error, there can be some um, a variation in the counts and everything based upon that. So we have to treat the patient rather than treating values. So always look, look for a trend in counts on the single value because many times, sometimes it happens to be a viral illness or uh, all this can be transient, which can be uh, like uh, over a period of time in two to three days, there will be a trend in the recovering phase, which we can uh, easily check by serially measuring for the counts. And uh, it's always advised to prefer, like perform peripheral smear, which gives uh, almost lots and lots of information in as far as hematology is concerned. And uh, coming like ITB is always a direct transfusion. Why I mentioned here is that many times we happen to see some patients, like any patient who is uh, fatal counts less than uh, 50,000 or less than uh, 1 lakh or so. Like uh, many times the patient was given a course of steroid outside. Again, all these patients that need not be ITP because only in ITP the steroids will be beneficial. Rest everything, if it happens to be sepsis, if it happens to be leukemia, if it happens to be lymphoma, you would, the uh, given a smallest amount of seeds which we which we give, is going to uh, hamper the diagnosis completely. So um, some patients definitely will require bone marrow based upon the clinical scenario, and then um, there are a number of drugs which are available based upon that uh, uh, based upon the diagnosis. And uh, with this, I will stop here, and I will be happy to take up the questions. And I hope I am on time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sridhar. And uh, any questions? Sridhar Gobal will be happy to answer. Dr. A.N. Uh, actually raised uh, his hands. T.N. Dr. T.N. Yes, sir. Yeah. So can I ask you? Hello. Yeah, Good please. Evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Um, so, uh, I have a doubt regarding the transparent, percentage transparent saturation, sir. Uh, how is it uh, helpful in uh, the treatment of anemia, sir? <laughs> Uh, the usefully that um, the transfer saturation it is extremely will be very low in case of iron deficiency anemia because all the receptors uh, like will be deficient of anemia and there will be deficiency of iron so this transfer in saturation is one thing um, because um, if it is less we will be more in favor of uh, iron deficiency if it is uh, more which is more in favor of iron of chronic disease so but again uh, many times uh, this laboratory parameters uh, need not uh, be completely correct what I can say because of the transition saturation is uh, slightly difficult to do. So we will just stick to peripheral smear, ferritin and uh, TIBC uh, which will give us a conclusion of uh, either it's high deficiency or 
uh, other uh, causes of anemia most of the times. Okay, sir. Uh, Dr. Sridhar Gopal, a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, see, in the spherocytosis case, you said that uh, even though the spleen, spleen was of big size, we deferred the splenectomy. Yes, but, sir. Uh, even minor trauma, that patient can have a splenic injury and produce massive bleeding, isn't it? Especially as a young fellow. Yes, so sir. What do you think of that? Because when it comes to trauma, then it will be an emergency situation and it will be uh, massive blood loss and can be life-threatening also. Yes, sir. But, uh, uh, sir, from surgical point of view, like I'm saying, sir, like mm. this patient as of now is not transmission dependent ah. because as per the criteria, as per the guidelines, only if the patient is transmission dependent, like the patients are requiring multiple transmissions or is the patient is extremely symptomatic for the anemia, what, like uh, extremely symptomatic for either anemia or because of sphenomegaly or for cosmetic purpose. Only these are the scenarios uh, where we will try to go with splenectomy because we know the complication post splenectomy. Yeah. So this scenario we have generally deferred because he received only one transmission that too when he had a fever okay. uh, because he after hospital admission where um, there was an increase in the, like uh, need for a requirement of blood and then he was transferred to the local hospital. So he was given lots of counseling, lots of reassurance. Only then we have said him not to do for. Uh, uh, splenectomy okay. as of now. Once if he becomes symptomatic, maybe he may be candidate for splenectomy also, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other uh, questions? There are uh, no more questions. Uh, then uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Sridhar Gobal uh, for uh, giving a wonderful lecture and uh, so many things I also knew about uh, the hidden hematological, hematological disorders, especially in our clinical practice, which are uh, actually common conditions uh, which uh, we should know of. And uh, I thank you, Dr. Sridhar Gobal. And uh, I thank all the consultants and all the doctors from the city of Coimbatore and uh, from Sri Ramakrishna Hospital for uh, joining this webinar. And uh, we'll meet you once again in the next uh, webinar next month. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Murli. Thank you. Thank I you, thank sir. our uh, marketing department also for uh, organizing this webinar. Thank you, sir. We'll close the session. Sure, sir. Yes, sir.